take your Bibles and turn First Peter chapter four. Wednesday night when Stephen announced this text from First Peter, I thought, oh, he's taken my scripture. We've been doing a series here on First Peter, and but I appreciate his message Wednesday night. First Peter. First Peter chapter four. First Peter chapter four, verse one. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walk in mischievousness, lust, excess of wine, revilings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and dead? And for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but were according to God and the Spirit. Holy God, we thank you for the privilege that we can come before you with your word, claiming your promises, claiming your power, claiming your strength this morning. I pray that the Spirit of God would guide each heart, each mind, that it might be receptible, or receptive to your word. Father, I ask that you use your servant. Give him strength by the Holy Spirit. Use him and glorify yourself in using him. Father, bless your word that Christ might be glorified. That Father, your name be magnified. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Looking at these first six verses of 1 Peter 4, uh, I want you to realize that there is no more relevant message for the American church today than we must be intent on holiness. These verses give hope. Many today mistakenly think that Christianity works if you're lucky enough to have a relatively clean past. But if you come from a rough background, then somehow the Bible and Christian discipleship are inadequate to deal with your problems and meet your needs. I will remind you of the same gospel that is the power of God for salvation for a uh, religious person such as the Jew is powerful for, of God for salvation for the pagan, the Greek. Romans 1.16 says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also 
to the group. These people to whom Peter has written had come from a pretty tough background. They had been victimized by sin. But no matter how sinful their past, and no matter how sinful your past may have been, you can be transformed by believing in the crucified, risen Lord Jesus Christ. And then learning to walk with Him. And then, as you're walking, obey His Word. And this is not to say that living a holy life will be easy. Clearly, it is not. As our text here shows, it is a constant struggle. Peter's readers of his epistle were being persecuted for their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those that profess openly their faith in Christ were persecuted. And some were even being ridiculed by their former friends because they no longer joined them in their drinking and sexual orgies. Persecution was making these believers wonder, why am I enduring this? Why don't I just go with the flow and enjoy the pleasures I used to enjoy? So Peter, in this portion of Scripture, counters this mentality by simply saying, you will stand before Christ who suffered for our sins and who will judge the living and the dead in light of that. You must be intent on holiness. And any sufferings that you may encounter for Christ's sake should strengthen you to live for the will of God and not for the lusts of men. See, our society today is becoming more and more intolerant of Christian beliefs. It wasn't this way only a few years ago. But it's astounding how far our country has gone in such a short time. Now the question I pose to you this morning, how do we prepare for the persecution and suffering? How should we pre prepare to be treated unjustly by friends, by co-workers, and sometimes family? because of Christ. I assure you this morning that Peter addresses that in this text this morning. In this passage, we will look at seven principles about how to suffer for injustice and to be holy in an ungodly age. The first thing I would have you to notice is that here in verse 1 Peter says, be prepared by remembering that Christ 
suffered. Look at verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. Now, I want you to realize that Peter says, arm yourselves. And this is a military term, uh, a, a term for a uh, warrior putting on his armor in preparation for battle. Uh, that word purpose, which you don't see here in the King James, is nonetheless uh, uh, in the Greek, and the word there means intention. I think it shows us here that holiness, holiness must be in our thinking and in our will to do. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself. Now, Peter calls us to remember Christ both by pointing us back to Christ's sufferings as we see in, in chapter 3 in verse uh, 18 for Christ also hath once suffered for our sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the Spirit. Now here again, uh, the word therefore is showing up, and uh, I, I wish sometimes we could take the, the Greek or whatever translation you have and put uh, the right words in there. Uh, but here, he's saying therefore, and it's also with the rest of the first statement of what Chapter 4 is saying, he's saying, therefore, since Christ suffered, Peter is directing the eyes of these saints to Christ and his suffering. And that would be important to these Christians to remember as they were suffering unjustly they would need to remember their Savior. In fact, the Christians in the book of Hebrews were also suffering for the faith. You remember in Hebrews 10, uh, verse 22, it says, But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great a fight of a, a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst you were made a gazing stop, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst you were uh, you become companions of them that were so used. In verse thirty-four. The writer to the Hebrews says this. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. I believe Paul wrote Hebrews and the writer now tells them to fix their eyes on Jesus uh, so that they would not become weary in their walk. Look what he says over in Hebrews, again, chapter 12, particularly in verse 2. He says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3 says, For consider him that endureth such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Those words in Hebrews, looking unto Jesus, can be translated fix because it means to turn your eyes away from the persecution from the abuse and from the worries and give a concentrated look to Christ that would enable you Hebrew Christians as well as Christians today to not grow weary and to be one that loses heart. In fact, tradition says this, that right before Peter was hung upside down on the cross, His wife went before him. And as they were dragging his wife off to be crucified, Peter said to his wife these words by tradition Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Often in the midst of suffering, people become self-centered. Uh, we're worried about our future. We're worried about what people will think. But Scripture declares that the best remedy for going through suffering is to become Christ-centered people. We are to have our eyes centered on Christ. Remember the Lord. I would have you to remember that Christ's friends betrayed Him in the time of His need. Remember that the false witnesses were gathered to lie about Him. Remember that he was mocked, that he was abused, that he was beaten and blooded. And remember that he was placed on a cross and separated from God as he bore the wrath of the Father for our sins. We must remember that while being beaten up and mocked, Christ cried out and he prayed for the accusers where he says, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. Peter says that remember that he entrusted himself to the Father. In the midst of suffering for righteousness, we must remember the Lord. Now, look at the end of verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. I think that we see here, be prepared by having the attitude of Christ as a soldier that is waiting to die. Now, what is the attitude that Christians must arm themselves with that is mentioned here in verse 1? Arm yourselves. 
Likewise, with the same mind. Now, remember, Peter speaks to a discouraged audience, and he says that in order to be able to suffer for righteousness, you must have the attitude of Christ. Philippians says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Now, what attitude is Peter talking about here? You see, the preposition, therefore, in 1 Peter 1, uh, 4, 1, points us back to what was said in the previous chapter. And, uh, and he seems to be talking about Christ's willingness to die. I draw your attention back to verse 18 again in chapter 3. For Christ who hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. When Peter talks about Christ's attitude in suffering, he is talking about his willingness not only to suffer, but to die. And as you see the words of Peter here, not only suffer, but die. Remember what Christ told his disciples over in the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 45. There he says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In fact, uh, uh, Peter uses the word arm when talking about Christ attitude. It's a military word used by soldiers and it literally means to arm oneself with weapons or to put on armor. So Peter speaks about the mindset of Christ as being ready for battle. Any good soldier in his service goes into battle to die. Ready to die. And it must be the same for us as believers. In fact, remember the words of the Apostle Paul to Timothy, where he said to Timothy, arm yourself with the same attitude over in 2 Timothy of Christ. All other Christians had separated from him, that is Paul, in his persecution according to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. And Paul says to Timothy that he must be like a soldier. Look what he says in 2 Timothy 2, 3. Endure hardships with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. This is how it must be for all Christians in a world that is antagonistic to Christ. It must be this way because of the world's antagonistic attitude toward, towards the Lord Jesus and His children as Christians and the teachings of Scripture. 
I would have you to listen to what the Lord Jesus says over in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 19. There he says, and he gives a verdict. He says that light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. John chapter 3 verses 19 to 20. Because the world loves evil, it hates the light. This means the world hated Christ and the world hated the righteousness that exposed their sin. If you live for Christ, you will receive the anger of those who love evil. Their lifestyle of righteousness exposes uh, uh, their, uh, it, maybe I should say, that this whole lifestyle of righteousness exposes their sins and it pricks their hearts. It creates an animosity even if you have done nothing And for this reason, you must be willing to suffer and even die for the Lord Jesus Christ. I would have you to see that this is the necessary attitude for all believers. This will keep the believer from compromising with the world in order to avoid suffering and abuse. In fact, Christ demanded if you have done nothing that demanded that this is all of all of us who would come and Follow him. you got to forgive me. I didn't take my brain pills today. Um, there's so much on my mind today, and I probably forget half the scripture that I have here. And Christ said over in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, he says, If anyone comes to me, does not hate his father, mother, his wife, and children, his brother and sisters, yes, even his own wife. He cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 26, 27. When Christ called the believers, He called everybody to carry their cross in order to be His disciple. Now, please understand, uh, it was not a spiritualization. It was literal. chapter 12, verse 31. He was claiming that God was his father. And in doing so, according to Jewish law, 
that was a capital offense. But we note that he was on his way to Jerusalem to die. And to follow Christ, especially at that point in his ministry, was dangerous and has been that way for Christians ever since. Obviously, in the last century, more people have been martyred for the faith than all of the centuries combined. Everyone who follows Christ still must take up their cross and be willing to die. And what Paul Peter is saying to those believers and he's saying to us, let us arm ourselves with that attitude as a good soldier of Christ. The one who does not have this attitude will compromise with their language and actions around their worldly friends because they are not willing to suffer for Christ. And those who do not have this attitude will love the world instead of loving Christ. This will make them unstable, unsteady, and unfaithful Christians. Look at the combination of verses 1 and 2. And we see the third principle here. For being prepared for suffering, he says, be prepared by recognizing our deliverance from sin in Christ's death. Verse 1 again, let's read it. Again, it says, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Note that phrase. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased. Sin. Now, I must tell you at this point, this is one of the most debated texts to come from 1 Peter. And if you look at verse 1, we have to ask the question, who is the he who suffered. Look at it carefully. In what way is he done with sin? This text, even though it's brought considerable debate among scholars, the question is, when we read verse 1, and it says, who, he who has suffered in his body, who is it referring to, Christ or to believers? If it was referring primarily to believers, it would not seem to fit, since suffering does not make us cease from sin. You still with me? Some believers in suffering actually fall further away from God. 
This is not the same inconsistency if it is referring to Christ's sufferings in his body because his death did pay for the penalty of sin and broke the power of sin <coughs> over the believer's life. Now let me throw a but in here. Because clearly in verse 2, Peter seems to be speaking directly to believers and not of Christ. Since Christ never lived in sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh of the lust, uh, to the lust of men, but through the will of God. Now, the question that we ask is, how should we understand this? Peter seems to be referring to Christ's suffering in the body and the defeat of sin in believers in verse 1. And then speaking to Christians how this reality should affect their relationship to sin in verse 2. This is the same argument that Paul uses for believers to stop sinning in Romans chapter 6. It does not mean that believers are eradicated from their sin nature. But I would have you to look at chapter 6 and notice what it says in verse 4 of the book of Romans. There it says this. Therefore we are buried <coughs> with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk, what? In the newness of life. For if we have planted together in the likeness of his death, we also shall be, uh, uh, we shall be also in, in, in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin be destroyed. And that henceforth we should not serve sin. Are you gathering what he says? <coughs> In spirit baptism, which happens at salvation, the believer is united with Christ's body in his death. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. And as it says in Romans 6, 6, our sin nature died with him. And therefore, no longer has power over us. Now please understand, the believer still sins, but he's no longer a slave to sin. The bonds have been broken. He is now free 
to live for the will of God because his sin nature died and was buried with Christ. And this is why a true believer is a new creation in Christ. And all things are passed away, 1 Corinthians uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And Paul again says, Walk in the newness of life. I submit to you that as we look at these verses, this is an important <coughs> doctrine for all believers to understand. It is this doctrine that enables us to conquer all sin and stay holy in the face of suffering. It, it, it is our uh, union with Christ in His death. We have died to sin and, and, and now are alive in Christ. Yes. Amen. And so Paul in Romans calls believers to think differently about themselves because of this fact. Listen again to what he says in chapter 6 and verse 11. Here he says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Look at that phrase. Likewise, reckon ye. This is an accounting term. And when the, when the believer looks at his uh, spiritual bank account, it's not like some of us who write checks and don't know if you have money there. But uh, when he looks at his uh, 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 spiritual, scriptural uh, 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 bank account, He understands that his debt to sin has been paid. He is no longer to obey those urges. In fact, Christ used the counting term on the cross when he said, It is finished. Which literally means paid in full. Believers must now understand what has happened in Christ so that they will not fall into sin when they're tempted or even confronted with persecution. The sin debt has been paid. Christ has redeemed us from the slavery of sin. And now we have become slaves to righteousness. And as Peter says, the believer now lives for the will of God. Look at verse 2. But to the will of God. God is the believer's new master and he serves righteousness instead of sin. I, I, I take you all the way back to Romans chapter 6 again. I want you to see what Paul says in verse 18 and 19. Paul says this. He says, being then made free from sin, ye become the servants 
of righteousness. And then he says in verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and unto iniquity, unto iniquity, <coughs> even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. we look at the Word of God, we realize that we are living in a time where persecution towards the church, biblical doctrine, is increasing even here in the Western nation. Peter outlines how the believer can be prepared to suffer unjustly. I said I'd have seven principles. And I ran out of paper on your outlines, you'll notice. Fourth principle is be prepared by recognizing See, we no longer fall the ways of the world. Why? Because we, as Peter says, aliens. Our citizenship is in heaven. And he said, be prepared by expecting abuse and suffering in this world. And the sixth principle is this. He said, be prepared by remembering God's will and that God will bring justice in His judgment. And the seventh principle is this. Be prepared by a focus on the gospel and the faithful that are before us. Heavenly Father, please take these words and use them to your honor and your glory. Father, I ask that you deal with our hearts this morning. Thank you. Thank you for giving us strength. Thank you. For the spiritual and life. Thank you, Lord, for the word. I pray for a, a further study by individuals into these verses as we take them up in a few weeks to see that death is the cutoff point for salvation. There's no second change. Even though some would misinterpret the scripture that we have had here in verse in chapter three and, and we'll have here in chapter four. That if we're not saved, judgment awaits from a holy God. the unbeliever. And Father, we pray for salvation today for individuals to come to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who suffered for our sins were buried and rose again that we might have life. And that He's coming again. He's coming in the clouds perhaps today that then in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet him in the air. I look forward to that meeting in the world. But if there be one here that does not know Christ, 
I pray that you would save that one so that they may have the hope of that reunion. I pray for Christians, particularly because I treat all of them. Peter is addressing that you will remember the great word that we have received by God's love. That we have a newness in Christ. We are a new creation. I pray that that would be understood. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.